Pete, speaking about your wife, tell the listeners what your mum said when you quit your job at General Electric and said you were going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> yes, last time when I spoke, I uh, was telling you this, right? Uh, I had this lucrative job uh, in General Electric. I, I was in aviation, then in energy business. When I came back to Bangalore, leaving that job, telling that I want to do something on my own, she was really shocked. Who's going to marry you? <laughs> Who's going to marry you? <laughs> so, I found a brave person in my wife. <laughs> she married me, knowing all the <laughs> challenges in uh, running a business and married to her. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nikhil Patel. This is the Indian Startup Show. And that was my guest, Ganesh Shankar, the founder and CEO of Fluxgen. Fluxgen is on a mission to help industries become water positive. He came on the show back in October 2017, believe it or not, and he's back again. So in this episode, he talks about celebrating 10 years as an entrepreneur, talks about how you go about improving your product using design thinking exercises. He talks about the time spent in the Cisco Launchpad Tech Accelerator, talks about dealing with the ongoing water crisis, and gives you bootstrapping advice, and talks about digitizing water structures. He also goes on to talk about questions you should ask before quitting your 9 to 5 job to a startup. And finally, we reminisce about his epic bike journey from Bangalore to Goa. And much, much more. So please enjoy the show. Thank you. Hi, Ganesh. Uh, thanks for coming back on the show again. Thanks a lot, Neil, for having me uh, on the show again. It's a real privilege. Yeah, I spoke to you back in uh, October 2017. Just briefly tell our listeners what you do. We are Fluxgen and uh, we help de-risking industries from water-related issues. So you might ask, what are water-related issues? There is a financial risk associated with mismanagement of water. There's a compliance risk associated to uh, water uh, not using uh, properly. And of course, there's a reputational risk if you are abusing water. uh, And we help industries to ensure they manage it in the best possible way. Uh, we help our solution helps industries to reduce water consumption by up to thirty mm-hmm. percent. Awesome stuff. And since we last spoke, what's been going on? Yes, uh, when we last spoke, which was in two thousand seventeen, we were transitioning from a projects and consulting company to a product company. Mm-hmm. But today, we have more than thirty plus clients and more than fifty plus location. Our solution is uh, running. Uh, our solution is called Aquagen. Aquagen is, as I said, is an AI and IoT based uh, water monitoring, tracking, analyzing, and uh, data science platform, which is a hardware and a SaaS platform, but which is helping our customers. Today, we have uh, customers like uh, Lactalis, uh, which is the largest dairy producer in the world. We have Britannia. We have uh, some of the very good uh, dairies uh, in South. India and we have in building section we have uh, enabled our solution to companies like uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and uh, various other companies. We have helped uh, you know, the oldest hospital mm-hmm. in, in India, where even the kings of Mysore used to get treated, which is in Coimbatore. So one of the highlights about this uh, uh, customer is that um, these guys were buying water from at a very high price and also had. Uh, 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 groundwater extraction, their water consumption was regularly increasing and they were being a very responsible organization, they were treating water. And then we came and uh, we digitized their entire water infrastructure and they were consuming almost like 500,000 liters of water before we came in and uh, after uh, we deployed the solution, we were able to give prescriptive alerts to their uh, staff, their uh, workforce, uh, which helped them to reduce water consumption from 500,000 to almost 300,000 liters of water. Mm-hmm which is almost a reduction of 200,000. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of uh, good success stories uh, has come out in uh, from the time we spoke. Yeah. So, you know, India is the largest groundwater extractor in the world. In fact, India's groundwater extraction is some of the groundwater extraction of all of China and the US. Wow. So in order to uh, make sure that there's a uh, uh, kind of a responsible consumption, government has made it mandatory that all groundwater extraction has to be uh, monitored Mm. and you have to pay for it. Mm. And in water stressed area, it is around 10x that you have to pay. Yeah, because back then when I spoke to you, we we talked about the the, the water crisis. So are are we still in the water crisis then? So Neil, I should tell you that uh, this being in this field itself is very depressing because you know all the things that is happening in water, right? And uh, because how much are we are doing today, uh, whether as a company or as a, as a community of entrepreneurs in the space, 
we feel that the amount of uh, uh, crisis is only increasing mm. uh, magnitude of crisis like uh, we are 7 billion uh, population world right and the amount of available uh, fresh water is uh, hardly less than less than a percentage and you mentioned the mvp uh, back in 2017 I, I forgot to ask you what what did that actually look like what did it actually do how, how did you build it what was the process behind that so i should be very thankful to one of this uh, client which mm. helped us build the mvp right i told you right we were a project and consulting company and uh, one of the projects that came in was from this company called titan jewelry division so they wanted to become water positive um, uh, by 20, by 2022 one of the thing was to ensure that all their water is monitored uh, digitally and they are also like you know they were looking at a homegrown solution within india and uh, they wanted we did a lot of this um, design thinking exercise right uh, the empathy mapping in terms of talking everybody in the workforce of the company involved in um, uh, maintenance and understood what are the problems that they see. Uh, we understood that they were buying water at a very high price. They were had done rainwater harvesting. They were also, their consumption of water was increasing. And they were taking hand readings of water through this mechanical flow meters. Mm. And uh, there were some places which was not even accessible to take data. Right. So, uh, and we also understood they were doing water treatment uh, because of, uh, and zero liquid discharge. So, they also told that how there would be a uh, some kind of a, a downtime because... Uh, sometimes this membrane technology would not work uh, for a long time. So all these things helped us understand the problem from an end-user point of view, which led us to actually design our hardware. So I should actually say that we thought we had to finish this project in three months, but it took nearly seven months to complete the project. So we are always thankful to that company, Titan Jewelry Division, uh, Mr. Murli who actually gave us a project. So as much as uh, startups like us are foolish in uh, trying to do something new, I mean, but that foolishness is uh, compensated by kindness to see, uh, to eventually see something that we have done as a wise, wise thing to do in life, right? So I think this combination of kind people coming together is what the MVP will be a successful thing. So if, <laughs> if they're not given that project, they're not seen that MVP that we had actually, or a prototype that we had put on that exhibition hall, and they are not taken that uh, chance to give that opportunity to us, I wouldn't have been talking to you today. Wow. And what did you do after that then? So you've got the MVP, you've got one customer or one client who's happy. So after we did this, we realized that uh, we should be a product company, mm. right? I mean, uh, that's when we had just got uh, selected to Cisco Launchpad. Right. So we had applied for an accelerator and we were fortunate to get selected to Cisco Launchpad, which is the most, so, most sought after accelerator, uh, at least in India. The, whatever we did in this uh, uh, Titan jewelry division, we converted that into a, a product idea. Mm. And we ended up talking to similar clients, mm. right? And uh, we had got a project from a manufacturing setup. But during this uh, interview process that we did with a lot of potential uh, clients, we figured out we should be in food and beverage industry. That's a segment that would badly need our solution, yeah. right? And uh, we are very thankful to our mentor there, uh, Nick. O'Connor, who was part of Cisco Launchpad, who actually asked very tough questions. And uh, we ended up uh, thinking deep after he asked those questions. What, and we what realized quest, what, um, what questions did he ask? So he asked, what is the primary driver for buying your solution? If not your solution, uh, how would they uh, even manage this? And is it a need or is it a nice to have? Is it like, uh, and uh, will, will the customer uh, be willing to pay uh, such that you would even be even profitable or is it just like neck to neck or hand to mouth. So, uh, and also in terms of why would uh, you be in business for next uh, two, three years and what would be the driver, uh, what are the environmental parameters around your product that would uh, uh, further drive you? Uh, like, uh, and uh, he also asked these questions like, uh, <laughs> Are there adjacent market which you, you can acquire if you acquire this segment? If you identify a segment, can you acquire more? So what is your beach head, right? And then uh, how would you expand your business to eventually, uh, you know, at the end of the day, every business want to be a sizable, whether it's a 10 million or 100 million or a billion dollars. So how would, what would be that? And is there enough, uh, uh, is there the market big enough 
for you to even uh, uh, continue in what you are doing or you should uh, find something else in the the same segment or go to a different segment using the same technology that you have developed so all these things uh, i mean there are many more questions so these are something that on top of my head of course there was also question on how would you eventually scale the business right and uh, so we also talked about something called two hours uh, that uh, a solution to all the problems referral i mean you retaining a customer and ref- a referral from a customer is what was going to eventually scale us yeah. so that was a terrific learning uh, during that time and eventually we had further learning from mark serrell uh, from uh, uh, berkeley's uh, waterhouse business school at berkeley oh, nice. uh, where we further got accelerated right this was part of innovation acceleration group at uh, waterhouse school at berkeley uh, so yes i think uh, uh, the what we also realized that water crisis is not limited to india or subcontinent uh, it's it's like kind of uh, uh, across the world did you, did you get any like criticism in the in the, in the early days Yeah absolutely so the thing is um, a lot of pushback uh, on uh, this uh, system because uh, water is uh, though how how i mean it's so essential right i said like many people have lived without love but not a day without water but still water is priced very low because of which the economics the financial uh, return on investment uh, were not very lucrative and has to be in this business so many people actually question why do you want to be in a field which is uh, actually uh, not priced right right so yes uh, in fact uh, that's uh, something that we understand even today on uh, many industries would not even see water as one of the top five costs mm. so being like if it is not in my top five costs why should i even buy a solution um, but we ended up doing a lot of study on uh, telling them the true cost of water is not that how much you buy the water at so water is also carrier of various other things that like water using water that also you are investing money on pumping purification recycling softening right so is the embedded energy associated to cost the true cost of water real cost of water is not when you have it when you don't have it right your whole industry shuts down if you don't have a uh, proper planning forecasting and a methodology to manage uh, water you are in deep risk it's just that cost of water looks very small when you don't have at all well let's talk about you then i believe you're celebrating 10 years as an entrepreneur how how, how do you how do you feel about that then it's quite an achievement <laughs> 10 years as an entrepreneur is um, for me uh, a kind of great learning yeah, i don't know if i would call it as an achievement as i told you earlier knowing this field i i know how little i have done right so i think miles to go a lot to be done but one thing i'm very happy is that at least i i have spent last 10 years knowing this field uh, inside out uh, though i don't know many things that i i should definitely tell you that this, every day is a learning so another thing is during this last 10 years i was also involved in uh, uh, spinning off some of the work that i did at fluxion into new entities okay whatever we did in solar first five years we were focused on solar yeah. I split it off into a new company called uh, Airprobe.tech. Right. And thanks to my two colleagues at Flaxen, one is Kausuk Karnataki uh, and other is Aditya Bhatt. They were willing to uh, take this company to new levels. And Airprobe is doing phenomenally well today, right? And Airprobe is able to uh, do drone scan mm-hmm. to identify faults in solar farm, right? So that way you are able to improve the efficiency of solar farm. a 2% increase in efficiency is like in uh, like more than 20% of increase in profits for our clients so today we have done uh, uh, fault detection for one of the largest uh, solar farms which includes uh, acmed uh, tata solar softbank energy renew a bunch of these things which includes the total cumulative would be more than 16 gigawatts of assets uh, the equivalent impact is the amount of energy saved is uh, powering 100000 urban houses so i'm very uh, glad that um, uh, uh, we were able to uh, spin off this and uh, were able to empower two young minds to become leaders in this in the 10 years that i am very glad about rather uh, proud of these two boys who have built a good team uh, i still uh, hold the role of chairman in that company i also co-founded a, a non-profit uh, section 8 uh, for impact organization okay. called the sustainability mafia yeah 
so <laughs> you would be you would find it funny the name is sakedi <laughs> mafia because we thought this uh, mafia for all the bad things why not a green mafia <laughs> right and uh, the people i met in last 10 years i was i was able to have a good relationship with them in terms of understanding how their solution work in terms of whether it's waste management energy management or water so we came together as a consortium of solution provider with a mission statement to multiply the impact of sustainability leaders through goal oriented collaboration and today uh, we are very happy that we have more than 50 plus solution providers we have been able to run a very uh, important programs like corporate program we have been able to run uh, sus talks every i mean uh, every fortnightly and we did tedx sus mafia last year and this year we are doing tedx sus mafia in uh, uh, november and attracting some of the uh, big leaders uh, in sustainability and climate action nice, nice. just just so, go, yeah, just 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 go back to the solar idea then so so you're sending a drone to find or fix faults in solar panels is that right just to explain how that works that's quite interesting see uh, basically when you have a solar farm right uh, the solar farm uh, would have uh, maintenance issues right. there would be ah. reduction of energy because some spring is not working or some solar panel is having some issue or an inverter is having a, a, a issue with respect to uh, efficiency yeah. so you have to be you have to send people across all the time to do visual inspection or use some multimeter or some of this equipment to find the fault which is very tedious and cumbersome and uh, practically not uh, doable always so what we do is we fly drones Mm. right I, one option could have been put sensors into all the solar panel but is that's very expensive instead put a sensor onto the sol- uh, onto the drone fly it everywhere and acquire this uh, thermal image and radiometric image and analyze this image to find out what could be the problem and we were able to do just that and we were able to identify more than 30 different faults by flying the drone and creating these images and what we started as flying the drones on our own we eventually had existing drone pilots to fly the drones on solar farms and take all the data onto our platform which is a deep learning model to identify these faults identify where all you have to fix instead of what used to be visual or manual process what would take days together to solve this would happen in less than uh, one hour time mm. which would save that amount of energy yeah. uh, today we are even able to do it uh, in various other, uh, in europe us and australia and middle east and various other places as well yeah. because we have developed a platform which can take any drone images um, of solar farms and is done and uh, able to solve this yes well, that's, that's, that's an amazing idea that uh, who came up with the idea So I I should definitely say the idea was a collaborative effort uh, by my friend Mehul and myself. Mm-hmm. So Mehul and myself went to college together in Jing uh, together and uh, not to our masters together and uh, we stayed continue to stay in touch and one of these days he actually uh, visited my office and uh, we were discussing about various problems that were uh, facing in the uh, uh, in solar industry uh, it was during the same time i was also offering a course at my alma mater in industry of science right we gave it as a problem statement to the students and the students did a good job and eventually we decided to build a product out of the classroom so <laughs> yeah a lot of effort has gone from multiple people so we can't just take the credit yeah. uh, entirely but yes <laughs> what's your drone flying skills like then we crashed any <laughs> uh, no actually aditya bhat who is the co-founder of this company um, was able to um, uh, come with the drone flying skill he was uh, he had just finished his undergrad from one of the top colleges in uh, bangalore rb college of engineering he was in a drone club there mm. and he knew the nitty gritties of flying drones and how it can use so he started <laughs> he was the one who actually uh, enabled uh, a drone tech into this uh, company as i said today I, i i don't i mean when i actually i should say when my wife became pregnant i stepped down from a full time role in that company yeah. and uh, these two uh, boys actually took it forward so yes aditya came with a strong drone tech understanding and kaustub came from strong solar understanding he had done his masters at kth in electrical power systems and his master's thesis was also on solar so so that way the kind of a great uh, partnership let's be Spe- speaking about your wife tell the listeners what your mum said when you were going to be an when you quit your job at general electric and said you were going to be an entrepreneur <laughs> 
<laughs> yes last time when i spoke i was telling you this right uh, i had this lucrative job uh, in general electric uh, I, i was in aviation then in energy business when i came back to bangalore leaving that job telling that i want to do something on my own she was really shocked who is going to marry you <laughs> <laughs> he's going to marry you <laughs> <laughs> so i found a brave person in my wife <laughs> she married me knowing all the <laughs> challenges in uh, running a business and married to a uh, entrepreneur <laughs> itself was a good risk taking from our side <laughs> <laughs> but, but i remember you saying that your, your dad was quite supportive if you'd get into this yes uh, i should definitely say my dad is uh, probably as foolish as i am <laughs> so he thought i'll turn around and do something great so he just believed that i'll do something that is worthwhile he probably saw uh, that uh, there is a value in adventure so he was quite supportive and uh, he he still is very supportive i mean you know i mean uh, he just thinks that uh, i'll be able to do what i have in my mind what are my dreams i'm able to achieve so in, in during this last 10 years you know my my mom has transformed that way she's very a, a very happy and she ended up reading books on entrepreneurship <laughs> or rather <laughs> there are these books uh, by captain gopinath uh who's on oh, the yeah. yeah 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 i remember that guy yeah yeah i tried to get him on my podcast yeah he he podcast. reads the autobiography of his and she was actually very glad i mean that um, her son is also an entrepreneur was it indian airlines he started i think he started deccan airways deccan, deccan airways uh, that's it yeah 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 yes yeah that's a good story that actually yeah so 10 years would you would you change anything <laughs> I I would say uh, if I were to change anything uh, I I I should I would like to I should have met even more uh, people mm. than that than I am meeting today right today I meet a lot of people and I learn so many things from their experience mm. and um, there is there is a saying in Canada that's a Canada poetry that uh, you learn from first you learn by others directly then you learn by observing others and rest of the mistakes you do anyway on your own i want to instead of doing the third thing doing mistakes entirely on my own i would rather want to learn from others so if i had a chance if i had a time machine i, I would have met all the entrepreneurs that i had come in i had met in my life or would have met or talked to them understand uh, what were the uh, things that they faced and at least uh, cover those mistakes that they did so that i don't have to do that mistake rest of the mistakes i would have anyway done in last 10 years so if there is something a time like a time machine i would have probably met more wise people because mm-hmm. i remember you saying you bootstrapped it at the start any sort of bootstrapping do's or don'ts anything that helped anything that didn't help for our listeners who probably do the same thing see i think bootstrapping is definitely a good idea mm-hmm. as long as you don't have a scalable plan right once you have a scalable plan i mean a plan where you know it's just like this uh if you uh if you want to uh, get a rocket fuel then you should also have a rocket engine until you get a rocket engine don't get rocket fuel it will just waste of uh, money right so uh, bootstrapping is good until you have a scalable plan and small funds it's all fine but um, you have to find the product market fit and see how much uh, potential is there in the market whether you would be able to uh, really uh, fly take off well then only you should take that kind of fund so i still believe that yeah so obviously 10 years uh, what what's the next 10 years going to be look, looking like then so uh, next 10 years perhaps i want to pursue uh, harder in the field of water uh, the last 10 years i was like uh, i had a career uh, a vision to make sustainability the default choice i wanted to work on eco friendly engineering solution for our country people that's what i had actually put in my resignation letter to g but next 10 years i, I, I have a, a goal saying that de risk industries from water related issues make industries water positive so i'd be i'd be more focused on not just environment in general but water in specific and uh, so identify more problems in water that are faced by water consumers of water whether it's industry commercial facilities go deep into it and solve this mm-hmm. so that would be my next 10 years mm-hmm. like yeah yeah interesting so uh, how fast are you growing then because obviously you mentioned you know 20 to 30 companies are already signed up so we have around 100 companies uh, as i told you in right. pipeline and we have a visibility of uh, i mean direct visibility of more than 1000 plus companies who would want a solution 
it's a matter of fact that we acquire these uh, all these thousand companies mm. right and um, we should be able to uh, uh, eventually uh, become a hardcore saas platform where the various partners would be able to bring in their uh, uh, sensors and they would want to become system integrators of our solution by licensing our software right so so that it becomes a pure play uh, saas company um, yeah uh, we definitely think at least in india all the top 1000 uh, sebi listed companies should be using our product and uh, uh, internationally uh, uh, we should be able to grow in uh, some of the strategic segments especially large guzzlers of water like food processing and beverage industries uh, across the globe we would definitely be able to uh, grow No, it sounds exciting. Um, I have to ask, how are you keeping on top of all these things? <laughs> so one of the things is, uh, of course, as I told you, I have been a visiting faculty at the University of Science. I offer this course on uh, uh, product prototyping in IoT, uh, IoT and data science for clean tech and agri tech and industrial IoT. I have been offering this course. Of course, uh, I took a pause after I recently became a father. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, because being uh, in this, um, when I, when you are actually offering a course, you read a lot yeah. because you. want to give the best value to your students also these students have uh, investing their time and money to this course so i should do enough justice right so in this process i i learn a lot and many times my i give assignments to my students who end up doing incredible job mm-hmm. in me reading their assignments help me understand a lot of things that i would otherwise not get to know and i'm also part of uh, something called iet which is uh, chaired by dr shri patnagar and in this group there's all these events uh, where i do attend especially some of the events related to iot and clean tech and i have also been a speaker in many of these events in various uh, conferences and events so when you have when you are part of an event invariably there will be a lot of questions that are asked to you sometimes i would not know the answer so that's when i go back and check <laughs> uh what's that about attending events talking to my students and being part of this industry consortiums really helps a lot in uh, upgrading your knowledge and uh, get key market insights mm. so so if someone's listening and they want to get into internet of things uh and they want to build a solution an iot solution what advice would you give them what what should they be doing what's the first thing they should be doing see the most important thing i would like to uh, tell any aspiring entrepreneur in iot is uh, talk to the customer first mm-hmm. understand their problem understand uh, how are they solving it today uh, how would they uh, how would their problem be solved using their technology what is the uh, delta in terms of uh, what is the change uh, that a customer would get by using their technology and um, how uh, what is the benefit uh, financial or or rather it is tangible or intangible so list it down and really see if they were to be in the customer shoes would they buy the product yeah dispassionately ask that question and if the answer is yes go ahead and build it i'm mm. sure if if you are true to yourself and you really see that value if you are to, uh, then i think it, you they should just go ahead and build that product mm. having said that they should also understand if there are if they have talked to say 10 to 20 customers try to understand how does that Uh, map to the market as a whole right and would there be enough people to buy when they build a product it's not just for these 10 20 people and uh, go going into the depth of the market is very very important uh, before building the product mm. so this is the two cents i would like to give so start with the customer first and then the idea or yeah, start yeah, with the idea yeah. and then the customer um i would always uh, say I don't know actually to be honest uh, uh, I don't know to take a, a stab at this yeah. it depends in our case it was a customer we met the customer and then we built the product right and I know many people who start with an idea and um, we end they end up building the product yeah. so uh, so it's good to be um, uh, I mean one of the things that I learned from Nick is be very skeptically optimistic <laughs> So I don't think I answered your question, but still, I hope I can. No, no, sk- <laughs> skeptically optimistic. That sounds good. That um, I have to ask. Please tell the listeners what happened on fourteenth of fourteenth of February. <laughs> it was, it was a so pro- I started. It, to... it was a proposal, but not not the type of proposal <laughs> that your mum was well, your mum was hoping for. <laughs> 
14th February 2012, I actually got the first purchase order from <laughs> okay. Port Plus Cell Engineering Technologies. So, that was a proposal. I got accepted. Yeah. Right? <laughs> So I, I think that's one of the best Valentine's Day ever. Uh, <laughs> though my wife will be pissed off when she hears this. Because <laughs> <laughs> because I, I remember you telling me about that, and uh, you were pretty relaxed there. Because obviously it took a long time to get your first first proposal. You you were fairly relaxed about it. Uh, most people be like panicking. See, um, I had this uh, thing for entrepreneurship uh, quite early in my life. Right. Uh, when I was in uh, engineering, I used to run a laboratory tuition because passing in this laboratory was difficult and uh, I had uh, got good money by doing that. But it actually faded away after some time because I ended up taking a job and things like that. Yeah. And when I went to my master's, uh, while I was supposed to work on something called quadruple iron trap, I was uh, many times outside the lab having discussions on philosophy of Plato, Aristotle, Krishnamurti, At the time I realized that uh, anything done in hurry uh, is not rather good. And you should have a, you should not have a game plan for like one month, two months. You would have a game plan for your life. The next instant, uh, next time when I started a company, I, I thought I would at least think a little deep and not take it to this one. I mean, uh, like um, in that hurried, hurried mode. Mm. So I, 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 when I started Fluxion uh, 10 years ago, I knew that rest of my life, I would be probably an entrepreneur and uh, I have 40 years of career ahead. I shouldn't just get affected by the hiccups so easily. And if I'm actually getting affected, then I would end up not be able to pursue on a purpose for a long duration. So all this discussion, lunch table discussion that we used to have in our mess, all these things um, of uh, being involved in a philosophical discussion on understanding about the purpose of life and how do you want to maneuver for next, uh, say, how long you are alive. I, these things really calm you down and you can drive in a direction that is uh, towards a goal, but not affected by all the externalities around you. Not getting a purchase order is an externality. You shouldn't get affected by that, right? I mean, it's easier said than done, but still, right? I, I was able to practice to an extent by that time and that really helped me out to not get in a panicky mode when we are trying to build something and things are not happening. Yeah, we have to talk about the you know, pandemic. Um, how, how did it sort of change you? Uh, how, how did it change the business? So yeah, pandemic uh, really affected us, right? Uh, because most of our customers, like whether it's a company, whether we had textile industry as one of our big customer base, right? And we had done many pilots there and suddenly people stopped buying clothes, right? So obviously if they're not buying clothes, these people were not in business. Mm. So they would not buy our water management solution. And there was like interstate travel ban, uh, rather a strict uh, work from home thing, right? Our solution would actually be installed at these locations. So it did suddenly stop, like we are sh our shop was shut. So, uh, but yes, we realized that uh, it's a time to grow in terms of our product uh, technology. So we got great support from a person called Rakesh Sharma mm -hmm. from Cisco. And he was from the design thinking team of Cisco. He actually helped, took us through, how do we imagine our product in the next two to three years? And he took us through this whole design user journey map and various other design thinking exercises that led us to understand what we are going to build in next one year. So that way, a lot of development happened during that uh, pandemic time. Of course, we got hit in terms of revenue, customers, but uh, we, we were getting prepared. During this time, we also did uh, projects where we didn't go and deploy our solution. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the system integrators were able to do. This made our solution plug and play. So because our solution is now plug and play, anybody anywhere in the world can install our system. That that was like uh, uh, the advantage uh, of uh, uh, the uh, obstacle we were facing. As they say, obstacle is the path. So this obstacle of pandemic enabled us to innovate, to make something that can uh, be installed anywhere, any place, uh, you know, anytime uh, without our involvement. Let's talk about more about the design thinking. That's, that's, that's quite interesting. Huh? Is it just basically brainstorming? Yeah. So design thinking by itself is a very human-centered approach. Mm. So many times we only think from the technology lens. 
we think from the business lens financial lens but not me uh, thinking from why would anybody want the solution and how would they want it and how would they like to use it and how would it benefit uh, from a human centered point of view right so that means we ended up doing a lot of interview with uh, potential uh, customers of our product and design thinking was uh, basically uh, ensuring that what we are building is useful and they would find it comfortable to use and they would actually like to use it often and they would actually even tell us what benefits that can be uh, coming out of our system even that we have not thought of the technology yet business lens uh, it also means understanding the archetype of your customer whether they are a engineering production manager or whether they are a, a finance person whether they are a executive so what are their needs and understanding it to the depth and whom are we giving our product to if we are giving to the production head what are their actual needs and uh, are we designing according to that and how do you know that oh, you only know when you actually talk to these people the mapping map their needs into a product written and then uh, build a road map around it and there are some things that they would want in urgent some of them think they would want it over a period of time right and uh, all these things were captured during these interviews that we had with the potential customers even we do it even today when they use our product we ask them are is it really solving your problem mm. you can be completely honest tell us where is it where is the problem that also helps us uh, uh, know what are the what should include in our product roadmap and the customer success manager who is also thinks from a design thinking uh, lens always asks uh, how can we help you more mm. what else can we do Right. All these things uh, is are the thoughts that come to my mind when you ask me about design thinking. Mm. Yeah, well, last three questions then, because I remember you saying you quit your job at GE. Obviously, there may be some other people listening who may be thinking of quitting their jobs to do a startup. What should they be thinking about? Yeah, first thing I should say they shouldn't do just like I did. I did it in just I just quit my job and uh, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I would never recommend anybody to do that. As I said, I was foundationally very foolish. right so i would rather tell all of them spend your weekends spend your evenings doing um, uh, writing down what they want to build what do you think is a problem they are facing in the world that they can be the solution like as uh, our father of nation uh, say right i mean be the change you want to see think of what is that change they want to bring in i mean there are various motivation to start a company uh, uh, i mean impact necessarily is not the only motivation even if they want to do for whatever reason right find out what that reason is i would say what simon sinek says start with why so even before quitting the job think about the problem go into the depth of the problem uh, do as much analysis uh, of the problem mm. find out who else is solving that problem why they are not fully solving that problem and why you think you can solve it better uh, it, it's not always in terms of technology or product it could be various other reasons that they could do it better so not always think from this point of view uh, also try to uh, figure out uh, what is that unfair advantage they have in solving that problem i'll just quickly ask you a question why does uh, an african american always wins in marathon training no they have a larger lung capacity right okay right? i mean that doesn't disqualify them from uh, uh, competing right so people have to find out what is our what is that equivalent in uh, no. what they want to do right i mean it's not necessary you should always have a uh, a larger lung lung capacity to win marathon i'm not saying that yeah. but if you have you're always <laughs> so like that if they can try to find out all these points like what is that inherent i mean uh, that comes whether in terms of their uh, family or whether it is in terms of uh, education or in terms of the network they have or they already worked in something for like 10 years in that company and they have gained that uh, expertise in something or they have found this there's nobody solving this problem for their own company and they have been solving it on their own right and uh, so these are the things that they should be thinking even before <laughs> sending out a resignation letter mm. right that's what i would recommend there's a whole lot of time right i mean uh, we spend we waste a lot of time uh, they could actually utilize the time to think go deep or maybe uh, do a, a, a thing of i mean not even fully launch the product do a beta version or alpha version even before quitting their job and see how people like it or talk to somebody so I, the short answer is that try something and try to experience what they are trying to build 
And then, yeah, you can always send a resignation letter. On the last podcast, we talk about cycling from Bang- Bangalore to Goa. I was wondering if you've done any more cycling journeys or epic cycling journeys. <laughs> so, um, in fact, I keep telling uh, everybody that one of the uh, uh, pre-marital, uh, or rather uh, pre-nuptial agreement <laughs> that I had... Uh, uh, with my wife was that I would want to do cycle rides mm-hmm. on August 15th, which is Independence Day, Republic Day, 26th uh, January and October 2nd, mm-hmm. Gandhi Jayanti. These are the three uh, times, I mean, whether it's one day, two day, three day, day plan, I would want to do this cycle rides. I'm very glad <laughs> she accepted that. And she, I, I mean, I, I just, I'm not at home or I'm not at work or anything. I just do the cycle ride thing these three times uh, a year. And um, I, I've, I've not missed even a single ride during this time. Yeah, we did a bunch of rides. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if you would be able to uh, say we did, we went to Mangalore, uh, which is again a coastal uh, yeah. state, coastal uh, city in uh, Karnataka mm-hmm. uh, in South India. So like that, we did many rides. We went to beautiful forest Last uh, few days back, we went to a place uh, close to Kanakpura from Bangalore and there uh, again, we cycled around any place. We ideally do some 200 to 300, not been able to do like that epic uh, uh, 650 kilometers kind of ride. But yeah, uh, I'm 38 years old now, but still able to do around 120 per day. So I'm happy about it. (laughs) Yeah, because what was the original inspiration for you to do that Bangalore to go around? I'm very surprised that uh, it is my uh, convocation speech uh, comments uh, by Padmanabhan, G. Padmanabhan, Professor right. G. Padmanabhan from India Institute of Science. When I received my degree, that is my master's uh, degree certificate, he gave a very amazing speech. He said, your life is long, accompanied with a hobby or a sport or something that makes you feel light. After that, I actually kind of started doing a lot of these things, right? And uh, many times, these small events in life have big impact on your life, right? So, yeah. Because I've done Bangalore to Goa in a bus, and that was diff- that was hard. That was difficult. Because um, it, it, when you get to Goa, it's quite a few hills. So you, you must have found that difficult. Yes, when we did this Bangalore to Goa, I should definitely thank my dear friend Jonathan Fernandez. Mm. So Jonathan uh, was a junior of mine at Indian Institute of Science. He had made this pledge that if he gets admission to one of the top U.S. university for his uh, PhD, he would either walk all the way from Bangalore to Goa or cycle from Bangalore to Goa. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he chose <laughs> gl- yeah, cycling. You might be still walking. So, I, I'm also very glad he chose. And I came to know from another friend. And I reached out to him saying that, dude, I want to do that, man. I mean, like... Uh, it sounds so liberating to do a cycle ride from Bangalore. To think about it itself is uh, so liberating. So I want to do this. And then we did a lot of uh, one-day rides. Then we did a couple of days ride, three-day ride. And we were prepared to do this ride from Bangalore to Goa. So I had also made up my mind. Or rather, or rather, I told this to myself that if I'm able to do this ride from Bangalore to Goa, I should be able to do anything that comes in my way in my life. How long did it take? So uh, that cycle ride was, I think, for five days. Mm. Uh, each day we did around 120 kilometers and we managed to do around 625 to 650 kilometers. Awesome stuff. Yeah, so talk about the ongoing climate crisis then. See, the climate crisis that we are facing today is all man-made. Of course, the sunspot has its own way, but the way the planet is becoming warmer it is going to change a lot of things. Like we are already seeing bushfires, we see about flood, drought. So how does this happen? This happens because of our consumption. I think it's it's time that we start thinking about what are we consuming? What are we buying? What are we using on a daily basis? How does that impact the temperature of the planet? When you start thinking deep about it, you'll change the way you're doing things. Right, whether the way you commute, whether the way you start buying things, every everything that we consume has an environmental footprint. Yeah. It's time that people start thinking about what they're buying and what is their environmental footprint. A lot will change. A planet will, if not go down, the temperature may not go down, but at least will stay where it is. Eventually, uh, when we realize it to the depth, probably the temperature will come back to what it was when Ashoka to Akbar ruled this world. Right. So my thing is being aware 
of what we are consuming itself is a very good starting point so that's what i would like to tell everybody and that's what something i want to tell the future entrepreneurs in this space there are this is this is a great opportunity to actually uh, work on and um, it's not that you're saving the planet planet is going to be there it's you're saving humanity and all the habitats around here mm-hmm. yeah that's wise. what i want to tell to all the audience here yeah definitely wise words uh, last question then uh, for people who want more information on you and fluxgen uh, what must they do they should reach out to me uh, on my website ganeshankar.in or they should uh, uh, go add, uh, write an email to me ganesh@fluxgentech.com or they should just <laughs> find me in any social media so i i will be more than happy to get connected i i come on these uh, podcasts where i get opportunity like this mainly to get connected to people so i i i think people should just reach out to me in whatever way they can find in this medium i i, I would definitely like to uh, understand uh, if, if they have any uh, goals aligned or they just or they just simply want to chat with me happy to chat with them awesome stuff uh, ganesh uh, thank you for coming on the indian startup show today much appreciated thank you so much neil i think you have been very very kind to invite me again and i i really feel really really privileged to be on your show because i hear your show it's like many people i know uh, hear your show so i feel oh my god i i can get a chance and <laughs> i can communicate some of my ideas so thank you thank you so much no worries but ple- ple- pleasure is all mine honestly zero is uh thank you now bye bye Cheers, thanks to ganesh for coming on the show today i really enjoyed it as for more information go to flukgen.com that is the end of the show and if that, and i thank you for listening and supporting the podcast and i shall be back next week and if you're building something really exciting please send me an email hello at neilpatel.co or you can tweet at indian startup sh or go to facebook.com forward slash indian startup show love to connect thank you and goodbye